this paper comes out of some work actually from another PLDI, PLDI 2016, uh, the temporal netcat work. But this is a generalization of that. So um, my plan for today is a sort of three-part plan. So first I want to talk to you uh, about what a clean algebra with tests is. Then I want to talk about what I think they're for and what maybe they're not for so much. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you what we did and sort of how you, how you can make one. So let's get started. Uh, uh, clean algebra with tests, or CAT, is um, to a first approximation a generalization of the while programming language. So, um, so here's a while program. It's got an infinite. Uh, so if i is less than 50, we'll increment the variable i. Otherwise, we'll di uh, double increment the variable j. Simple enough while program. Um, and we can encode that into cat by sort of assigning some Greek letters to the, to the various forms. So, so we'll say i less than 50, that'll be alpha, and then i plus equals 1, we'll call that uh, uh, pi, and then j plus equals 2, we'll call that xi. Okay, and then we can encode this into clean algebra with tests, which is sort of an algebraic kind of framework uh, using some, some operators. So uh, first off, let's just be clear for terminology that alpha, that's a test or a predicate. These are uh, pi and xi, these are actions or commands. So parallel composition says do both of these things at once. Sequential composition says do these things in order. So here we're saying uh, when alpha holds, do pi. That is when i is less than 50, increment i. Uh, and when alpha does not hold, we've got that negation there, uh, uh, then do uh, xi. That is say j, double increment j. Coding straightforward? Sick. OK, so, uh, so here's a while program that uses a while signature feature, uh, while loops. Uh, it's a little more complicated, so we've got some assume assert stuff, so maybe some verification ideas are, are going through your head. So, you know, supposing that i uh, starts out less than 50, alpha, uh, while i is less than 100, we'll increment i and double increment j, and at the end, we expect j to be greater than 100. This assertion should always hold, because we're going to do at least 50 runs of the loop. Right? Cool. This is the sort of program that one might want to verify. So we can get this into cat uh, uh, using the same tool, so we have um, uh, our test and predicate that we've matched and the action command. Then we do sequential composition to say, here's the program that we're doing. There's no sort of branching control flow in terms of if, so we have no pluses here. Uh, we do have a cleany star. This is where the cleany and cleany algebra is coming from. So this is zero or more runs of this loop. So a way to think about it is, well, we'll start out, we'll say alpha has to hold, i has to be less than 50. And then so long as i is less than 100, we'll increment i and double increment j. And then eventually not beta, right? i will no longer uh, be less than 100. So we've finished the while loop. And now we'll check our assert gamma. Right, so we've got the clean start and the, the same negation. Okay. Clear again, the encoding? Straightforward? Okay, fantastic. So uh, to a first approximation, this is a great way to understand cat. Now, I should be clear, cleany star is more general than a while loop. And plus is more general than an if. If, if you just want while programs, you should check out this paper from Popple 2020 um, called GCAT. And it's like, this is exactly well. So you should check, you should check that one out. Uh, that's not what I'm going to talk about. So one of the cool things about CAT, now that we've got a sense of sort of the kinds of things that it does, one of the cool things about CAT is uh, that you can ask equivalence questions. So for example, if these two programs are equivalent, uh, then the assertion gamma always passes. And so we, we verified something about it. That's pretty cool. Right? And a particularly cool thing about CAT is that CAT equivalence is decidable. Fantastic. Right? This is like, this is the best. We get to decide equivalences of better programs. So at this point, you, like, you should have alarm. Like, there should be like a klaxon going off in your brain. Like, so you're telling me that it is a generalization of while programs, and you're going to decide equalities of this thing. What are you, what are you talking about? Like, that cannot possibly be what you mean. Okay, what, what, what do I mean? Uh, well, uh, this equality doesn't hold. <laughs> This is not an equality in cat. These primitives don't mean anything. They're just Greek letters. Okay. So, okay. So, so we need to assign meaning to the primitives, right? Like on their own, like this is cool. Cat will decide a bunch of equivalences in while programs for you, but only the abstract ones. Nothing to do with your program. Like we know that pi and xi have something to do with variable j, and therefore should relate to alpha and beta in some particular way, but cat doesn't. So okay, that's cool. You can you can try to do this. So so uh, Dexter Cozen has this cool um, tech report where he like takes you know Windows driver code, which you know at the time he was writing was like particularly bad. We're in like Windows XP. Like it was it was a bad time. Right? If you weren't around, it was it was rough. Uh, so um, so you take code like this, and he and he does stuff like so. Like, oh, let's encode it. Okay, he's not using Greek letters. Nobody's perfect. Uh, and then um, you can still do math without them. It's actually fine. Uh, and then he adds some equations, 
uh, and says, okay, great, now we can prove things about this program. Because this now we've sort of characterized how the parts of this thing are going to work together. Now we can do it. So he says, okay, great, now we can decide it. There's a problem. When you add these equations, it stops being decidable. Okay, so that's a bummer. Yeah, I think CAD is not for this. If you want to do static analysis, you should write a static analysis. It's very tempting to look at CAD and be like, this is while programs plus plus. No, it's while programs minus minus. The programs don't mean anything. And then the moment you try to add meaning, it doesn't, they don't mean what you want. You can't get, you can't get the good parts anymore. So my first thing that I want to, I want to say is that if you want to use CAT, you should be using CAT when equivalence is decidable. Otherwise, you should be doing something else. Right? It's just, not, it's just not worth it. It's just like, why, why take the algebraic overhead? And then the next thing I would say is that CAT is going to be useful to you when your primitives are concrete. Right? You need to select some set of primitives that have meaning for the domain that you care about. So like, when is that, when is that good? Well, there's a CAT that's useful, the CAT that's useful, net CAT. It's awesome. Hi, Nate. So this is, this is Nate's cat, Carbon, the net cat cat. As a little Easter egg, uh, open up the, uh, the net cat paper sometime. Zoom in on Kleisley composition. We have a little treat. So what's net cat? Um, so net cat um, is, a, is, a, is a very influential paper. Um, and it, uh, it lets you sort of characterize how networks behave. And it, it does it using a cat. So you know, here's a cat term that represents uh, the wire in the middle between these two switches. Here's a, a net cat term that represents a switching policy that says host one and host two are allowed to talk to each other. And here's something that they call the crossbar that sort of characterizes the behavior of your network. And this was influential in networking because like, well, now we have a concrete single thing that lets you talk about the behavior of your network. And you can ask these equivalence queries and sort of decide you know, verification problems and like you have the network in your hand. Hugely influential in the networking world. It's super cool stuff. So let's see how it works. So what do they do? They do uh, what I just su suggested, right? So you, you, they add some primitives. So what are they? Well, there's two that represent finite state. These are the fields of the packet. And like here it writes n for natural number, but you can imagine IP addresses or you know, ether type or like whatever it is, right? It's like the, the, the fields of the packet. And they add one more thing, which is dupe for controlling tracing. So in networking, you don't just care about the input-output behavior of your whole thing. You also care about like, you know, did it go through the firewall? Things like that. So the history of the things matter. So they, they have some controlled tracing to think about how they want to do that. But then they do the thing that I said you shouldn't do, which is add a bunch of uh, equations. And it's like, well, now what do you do? Right? It's undecidable. It's like, well, I think a lesson of the last 20 years, especially in PL, is that undecidable in general does not mean undecidable for you. Right? Like, you know, sometimes you got to find out. Like, OK, so, so they say, well, let's just do it. Let's prove that our equational theory is sound and complete and get the decision procedure. So soundness is actually pretty chill. Really excited. It's cool. It's like, oh, by all these theorems from like Dexter Cozen and, and Ernie Cohen, we're basically set. Sick. Completeness is like a little more challenging. They define a reduced form. They define this thing called a language model. Um, and like you wouldn't want to work with either of these things directly, but then that lets them reduce it to sort of some properties of regular languages. And then they sort of like uh, define a normal form and implicitly show you how to normalize terms to that normal form. And then you work it out. You get something that looks like this, and you sort of work it all together. And it's cool. It's, like, it's super cool work. It's a great, it's a great paper. I think it's very clear, uh, and I think everyone should read it. But the problem is if you look at this paper and you say, well, great, I don't want to do net cat. I want to do some other cat. You have to make a change to this. And maybe that change is really simple to make, and maybe it isn't. And you have something else. I also, I mean, I think that's problem one. Problem two is like, what's the story of net cat? Well, like, Nate and Jen had a bunch of things that were like not quite net cat. And then he came to Cornell and was like talking about it. And then it's like, oh, like, like it's, it's a cat. We sort of like could figure this out. And uh, the goal of our work is to try to scale beyond becoming a collaborator with Dexter Cozen for getting to write another cat. That's like the goal of what we're doing. Because like, I mean, it would be great if everyone could collaborate with Dexter Cozen, but the man's got to sleep, right? Like, it's, it's not going to work. So, so let's, let's talk about what we did. Let's, uh, let's zoom in. Um, uh, so like we recover a bunch of cats from the literature. I'm going to give you just the highest level view of what we do, because kind of the gist of it is like you actually don't need to know how it works. It's like the whole point. Like the whole aim of what we're doing is for you to not need to listen to the next like three minutes of my talk. But it'd be polite. <laughs> OK, so what are we going to do? So you're gonna, we're going to take a, a cat, and we're going to add uh, some primitives to it. OK, cool. So let's do the simplest one. We're going to add Booleans. So what do you do? You can, like, you can set a Boolean variable to false or true. I'm not using Greek letters. I'm using heavy metal mathematics just for fun. 
That's uh, Fractor. You can you choose your own adventure. And then, and then for, for predicates, I'm just going to have a true test. We don't need a test for false because we have negation. Okay, so this is this is the it's a, it's a theory of bit vectors basically that we're going to reason about. So how does it work? So for us, what you'll do is you'll define weakest preconditions. You have to relate every pair of action and predicate, and tell us what the weakest precondition is. Um, now you'll have to also give us some laws, and there's an ordering constraint where the the resulting weakest precondition needs to be no larger than uh, the thing you started with. So all this is necessary for termination of our method. But then the gist is we can generalize this weakest preconditions to get a normalization routine that lets us do a completeness proof, and none of it is a thing that you have to think about. I'll give you the gist of how it works, though, just if, for the sake of actually talking about our work. Um, so here's a, here's a pretty simple program. It flips a bit some number of times and then asserts that the bit is true. So you can, it's either of these two programs. Uh, I'm cheating and using some of the encodings. I said there, we don't have that x equals false. Let's just, let's just be cool about it. So the way our encoding works is the following. Like, let, let's think about it. The, the, when it starts out, the bit is either true or false. There's sort of two worlds. And if you start in the true world, then you're going to flip it an even number of times. And if you start in the false world, you're going to flip it an odd number of times. Does that make sense? You can sort of check it in your head. Cool. All right, sick. So, and the key insight here is like, well, your original term is going to be equal to this one. But then notice all of the tests are at the front. And that lets us use some like cool stuff from cleaning algebra and regular languages to just sort of do word equivalence on the actions on the other end. And then we can like decide equivalence uh, using this stuff. And like, there's some big relation in the paper that like, you don't look at this. Stop looking at this. So, like, you, like you, there's a way that it works, right? Okay. I think one of the coolest things about it is that it's a pay as you go thing. Right, so, so if you give us test actions in the semantics, you have a cat with the, our tracing semantics. If you give us sound axioms for the primitives, then you have a sound cat. If you give us complete axioms with an ordering on the, on the weakest preconditions, you have a complete cat. And if you can uh, check satisfiability for the theory of tests, then you have a decidable cat. So sort of pay as you go. Um, and that's literally, I mean, that's how it works in our implementation, right? Like, you just give us these things and then we give them back to you. So, like, you can see the tests and actions defined in the OCaml up there. Uh, there's some, like, boilerplate. And then here's parsing so that you can just, like, reuse our cat parser. Um, there's the weakest preconditions down there on the bottom. Um, there's the ordering. Uh, here's some optimizations that, like, just, like, for the smart constructors, you don't really need them, kind of whatever. And then here's the satisfiability checker just encoding into Z3. Like, this is the actual theory of Booleans. In our implementation, you just write this module, does some cool uh, OCaml recursive module stuff that Ryan hacked up, and that's and that's it. Um, okay, so I want to conclude by talking a little bit about like future stuff and some some limitations of this work. Uh, so like, what where where are we going with this? So so one limitation here that I think would be cool to resolve in the future is that we are totally tracing. Every action matters. These terms are not equivalent in the theories we generate, and that's probably too fine grained. Right? In Netcat, you have this dupe primitive that lets you say, and this is a moment in time I would like to remember. But here, you're like cursed with a photographic memory, which means you're, you're not going to equate programs that maybe you wanted to. I think this is something that we can relax. I think it, there's definitely a bunch of techniques we could apply here. We just haven't done it. Um, another uh, limitation of our work is that our work uses rewriting. And it's sort of well known that the rewriting approach for um, equivalence checking for Cat is just not that fast. If you want a fast one, you write a, a whole other paper um, and uh, do it with automata. And I think that's the fast way to do these decision procedures. We know how to get automata for many of our theories, uh, but not for all of them, notably not for past time, uh, finite time uh, LTL. We, we're not sure exactly how to set up the automata for that. Um, but I think it's something that is also totally possible, uh, and especially combined with more controlled tracing would be a, a positive development. Um, I said cat is not for static analysis. What is cat for? So like, what, what else could we use it for? Uh, I have two examples. Uh, one is smart homes. So smart homes are when you connect your light bulb to the internet. I don't know how they got that name. It doesn't make any sense. Whatever. So like, so it's a thing that a lot of people care about. And um, it's a reactive system with a sort of like, you know, you people use if this, then that, or Zapier, or whatever, to script the connections here. And I think th you can think about those scripts very clearly uh, using cat. I think it's a good candidate. Um, another good candidate would be for the internal logic of uh, games, like Twine-style games. These sort of text adventures. Think of like the locks and the keys and the items you pick up and move around. Uh, I think this is another domain uh, where we could do it. So broadly, like sort of FSM++, right? any reactive system like that. Um, and then just to, to make it clear that I think these are good ideas, there's two very strong research names. Uh, if this, then cat, and ball of twine, because cat's like twine. I think both of these are signs that these will be very strong research projects. So if you're interested in this, um, you, should, you should talk to me about it. Uh, we can talk about it after.
Okay, uh, thank you for listening to me about this. Uh, please check out the code on GitHub. Uh, it works, you should try to define your theories. I'd love to hear how it works for you. Um, thank you so much. Ah, I see a question on Slack. It's from uh, Nate Foster. How did you get a snapshot of my cat in my bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> sure, I think I took from, from Twitter. Okay, great, Ben. Hi, Michael. Uh, we saw bit vectors in detail, but what other examples have you worked out in the paper? Um, sure, yeah. So uh, in the paper, uh, I forget what we ended up excising. So we have, we have bit vectors. We have uh, monotonically increasing natural numbers. They could also be decreasing. There are limits, right? You can compare these naturals to a constant, but not to each other. If you compare them to each other, you have a counter machine. That's going to be undecidable. We're like right at the edge there. So there's these um, monotonic naturals, uh, sets. You can do maps over other theories, products of theories, uh, LTLF over, over other theories, the core of the netcat theory. Um, that's a, that's a sort of a sampling of them. Um, I think the, uh, we have all of those in the implementation other than LTLF. Um. So, okay, so your title, uh, you know, suggests a, a parallel with uh, SMT solvers. Mm. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to comment on, you know, do you think that uh, KMT solvers could be a, a, a different decision procedure that could be a foundation for uh, automated reasoning, or uh, are, you, are you more... Uh, are you bullish on that, or are you, are you more pessimistic? So, so I, I mean, like, like I said, I think that. Uh, it, so I, I think that these domains that I mentioned are possible good domains for other cats. I think that uh, in the end, KMT I think of as a. Uh, it is not directly an analogy to SMT, so maybe it's not a perfect name in that way. Um, I think of it as a way for people to prototype ideas in this space uh, without having to go to the trouble of writing like four papers to get a workable implementation so that you can see it doing good stuff. That's my thinking. Thanks, uh, thank Michael again.